Happy Saturday. When we talked about divers going to the wreck of the Empress of Ireland in 1914, I found myself idly wondering exactly what the diving technology was like that they were using at the time. And we have a whole episode on that subject, not not the specifics uh, of the dive to the Empress of Ireland or exactly what they would have been using, but on the development of diving technology from the earliest diving bells up to self-contained breathing systems. This originally came out on December 2nd, 2015. Enjoy! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. In the no surprise department, uh, the relationship that humans have had with bodies of water throughout history has pretty much always been one of fascination. And it seems like we have always been trying to find ways to transcend the limits of our pesky air breathing lungs so that we can get some time underwater. Uh, you have surely heard innumerable times that approximately 70% of the Earth's surface is water. So it makes sense that curious humans would be yearning to scope out the situation in the deep. And while humans were diving on their own for centuries before they started building assistance apparatus to do so, today we're going to talk a little bit just about the history of the technology specifically that's evolved over the centuries to give us some face time with the fish without suffocating. Uh, we're going to cover inventions designed specifically to enable humans to breathe underwater. While there are plenty of other advancements to diving, like fins and wetsuits, etc., we're pretty much focusing on the air here and like things that have enabled us to breathe. Uh, and as a heads up going into this one, in case you are a, a real uh, dive historian, I want to be clear that this is by no means an exhaustive history on the matter. If you go to any like even diving fan site and see like their discussion of dive history, there is usually a list roughly one kilometer long of like various advancements that have been made through the years. And so we can't really cover all of those without just reading a long list, which would be boring. Uh, because it has developed incrementally over centuries and it includes the work of just multitudes. So there's no way to include every single step in the course of one of our podcasts. So we're hitting as many of the key historical moments as possible. The first recorded account of some kind of diving technology that was designed to let humans breathe underwater was mentioned by Aristotle in the 4th century BCE in his Book of Problems. I love that name. Uh, this was a diving bell. And Aristotle des- described diving bells by saying, quote, they enable the divers to respire equally well by letting down a cauldron, for this does not fill with water but retains the air, for it is forced straight down into the water. If you're having trouble vis- visualizing that, it's like when you're a kid and you're putting the cup down in the sink, but in a way that's a vacuum so that you don't, or it's not a vacuum, it wasn't, doesn't let the water in. You know what I'm trying to say. So as a note, there is some debate about whether Aristotle actually wrote the Book of Problems. So take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, that's one of those many historical documents that people, uh, some people anyway, believe actually was written by someone later and then attributed to Aristotle. So also in the late 4th century BCE, Macedonian king Alexander the Great is on record as having employed a diving bell to explore the seas. That was beginning as early as age 11, according to this uh, sort of legend. So during the Battle of Tyre, he is said to have used a diving bell to supervise the work of divers that were under his command and were tasked with removing obstacles that would prevent passage into port. And once again, there is some debate about the truthfulness of that account. But there are, if you are a lover of visual mediums, some truly spectacular renderings of Alexander the Great submerged in a glass bell and observing the world from his underwater vantage. Some of them almost look creepy. There's one that I ran across where it looks like he is kind of... um, Creeping on some lovers in a boat on the surface of the water. <laughs> what? Uh, and there are others that just sort of look like him merrily sitting in his diving bell, kind of enjoying his view of the world from there. I'll see if I can find some pictures of this to put in our show notes. Uh, a most basic and classic example of a diving bell is narrow at the top and open at the bottom. So bell shaped like its name describes. As you push the bell straight down into the water, the air is trapped inside of it. So there's basically a bubble inside there in which a human can breathe. It's fine for a limited time before the oxygen is basically used up. And then you have to come back to the surface. 
And in order for a diving bell to counteract the buoyancy created by that air pocket that enables breathing, it also has to be quite heavy. So an open bottom diving bell also can't go very deep into water. There's a Peruvian vase dating back to around the year 200 that depicts a human figure. And on that hu- that figure's face is painted something that's been interpreted to signify goggles. The goggle interpretation uh, was arrived at due to the fact that this figure is also holding fish in each of his hands. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a pretty cute little vase. Um, so then the next, one of the next sort of major steps of where we see some sort of diving event happening in history uh, is around 1500, Leonardo da Vinci was sketching out ideas for what appeared to be diving apparatus, uh, but it seems that he never actually built one. Despite accounts going centuries back in the historical record, it wasn't until the 16th century that a successful diving bell submersion was conclusively documented. In the 1530s, Italy's Lake Nimi was explored in a diving bell designed by Guglielmo de Lorena as part of an operation to salvage barges that dated back to the time of Caligula. And in a write-up in Scientific American that was done in 1909, there was an account of this 1535 Lake Nemi dive, uh, and it describes the apparatus in the following way. Master Guglielmo de Lorena made a contrivance by which he entered the water and made himself descend to the bottom of the lake. And there he remained an hour, more or less, just as he wished, until the cold drove him up again. With this contrivance of his, one can work, sawing, cutting, corking up, tying ropes. One can also operate with hammers, chisels, pinchers, and other such tools, though one can use but little force because of the hindrance of the water. So apparently this version of a diving bell left the wearer with a lot of range of motion. So it suggested that it was smaller, a personal-sized diving bell, rather than one that could potentially accommodate multiple people inside of it or more thoroughly cover the diver's body. There's also a Chinese text that was written in 1587 entitled The Exploitation of the Works of Nature. And this featured some interesting illustrations of people that are walking on the seafloor uh, and they're tethered by ropes to ships above. And they have tubes that are basi- basically going from their mouths all the way up to the surface, presumably to breathe through. I keep thinking about these books that I love by this woman named Marie Brennan, and they're called The Natural History of Dragons. And they're kind of like a faux regency feeling fantasy series about this this widowed lady who studies dragons. And there's a whole arc involving another guy that's doing research in a diving bell and how heavy the bell is and how cumbersome and how tricky it is to get it in and out and how much it weighs in the ship and what an inconvenience that causes. Uh, that's what I've been thinking about the whole time we've been talking. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, like, we talk about it, and yes, they dropped it in the water, but, like, if it tipped at all to to one side, they basically had to pull the whole incredibly heavy thing up and start over. So before we get to an advancement in this technology that was made by a name very familiar to the podcast, let's pause for a word from one of our fabulous sponsors. In our recent episode on Sir Isaac Newton, we mentioned Sir Edmund Halley. And it turns out that Halley also figures into the human desire to explore underwater. In 1691, Halley completely changed things by adding a system that could replenish the air in the diving bell. It's almost always the case in the world of invention, however. He was likely aware of and building on the work of Denis Papin, who in 1689 came up with a plan to pump fresh air into the diving bell. Remember how he said before the break that he would run out of oxygen, so this would get fresh air in there. Yep, and we've talked many times about how most big breakthroughs in science and technology are building on the work of others. So this is a very similar situation. And Pepin's proposed method featured the use of a bellow system that would pump air into a bell at a constant pressure. But when Halley devised his system, he used a different method, uh, likely to differentiate himself from Pepin and avoid any claims of plagiarism. Halley's diving bell was made of wood and coated with lead. It covered 60 cubic feet, so that's 1.7 cubic meters of volume, and it had a glass top so that divers would have light while they were in there. There was also a valve on the bell attached to a barrel that could supply additional air. 
And the barrel was suspended in the water by a rope, and it could be pulled up to the surface so they could refill it with fresh air and then drop it back into the water, sinking thanks to a weighted bottom. And Halley's design was the first that enabled the equalization of pressure inside the bell and outside the bell because of the valve system that was used to supply this air. And it's sometimes even referred to as the precursor to the modern diving bell because of this. Halley also invented a smaller bell-shaped apparatus that could be worn like a helmet, although its intent was for the diver to be able to sort of get out from the diving bell, not to be a separate means to go underwater independently. And in a section of Halley's 1714 to 1716 work titled Philosophical Transactions, there is a section that is called, it's a long title, The Art of Living Underwater, or a discourse concerning the means of furnishing air to the bottom of the sea in any ordinary depths. And in this section of this work, he detailed the data that he actually gathered over years of experimenting with diving bells, and he explains how his particular technology works. One thing he mentions in this writing is the information gleaned from his testing that a gallon of air is used up and no longer suitable for respiration after about a minute. And, quote, though its elasticity be but little altered, yet in passing the lungs, it loses its vivifying spirit. Just kind of a poetic way to describe stale air. Don't keep breathing that. You're going to pass out. (laughs) Yeah, it's not going to work out well. In 1788, there was another major advancement in diving technology, and this was made by John Smeaton when he invented the diving air pump. And Smeaton's pump required four men to operate it. They were up on the surface, and it ran air through lines that attached to the top of the bell. And Smeaton's pump more closely resembled the concepts that were... uh a big part of Denis Papin's work than the way that Halley eventually set up the air supply. And this English engineer also redesigned the bell itself into a box shape. And he christened his a diving box or rather a diving chest rather than a diving bell. One thing we should mention here, and it really goes for advancement in any field, is that none of these new technologies were instantly adopted. In fact, even though Smeaton's pumps really advanced the field of diving, Halley's diving bells stayed in use until the 1800s. An English inventor named William James uh, designed a suit in 1825 that had a coil of metal tubing that wrapped around the diver's weight. And the idea was that air that was pumped into this tubing uh, but while they were on the surface, could provide a diver with an hour's worth of underwater time. Although there is no clear evidence, like we don't have a, a data right up the way that Halley did some of his, that this suit was ever actually tested. The following decade, inventor Augustus Ziebe invented what's considered to be the first diving dress. It's designed built on the work of John and Charles Dean, who had invented a smoke apparatus to enable firemen to breathe and move freely in burning buildings. The deans also adapted their invention into a diving helmet designed to sit on the diver's shoulders that would be fastened there with straps to a waist belt. The dean's patent diving dress was completed in 1828. It was a good functioning design, but if the diver couldn't stay upright underwater, the helmet would fill with water. As an aside, John and Charles Dean also published what is believed to be the first diving manual in 1836. Augustus Ziba's design, which came out in 1839, sealed the helmet to a diving suit to eliminate the problem of water rushing in if the diver tipped over or fell. Yeah, and keeping in mind that when you're walking, if you've ever walked underwater, you know that the seafloor is not exactly the most stable and constant of situations to be uh, stepping on. So it was a very real possibility that divers would shift side to side or lose their balance. In 1860, the French team of Benoit Rouquayrol and Auguste Dunerus came up with a suit design that featured a compressed air reservoir in addition to an air supply line. And the idea was that for brief jaunts, the diver could actually disconnect himself from that regular supply line and rely solely on the compressed air reservoir that he carried on his back. If you've ever seen the original illustrations for Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the dive helmet in them was based on these men's design. In 1878, a man named Henry Fluss ushered in a new era of diving technology when he patented a self-contained underwater breathing unit. Fluss's rebreather included a rubber mask. It is super creepy looking if you see pictures of it, uh, a breathing bag and a copper oxygen tank and a scrubber that would clean and refresh the air. The flu system was closed, 
So the used air was run through a length of rope yarn that had been soaked in caustic potash, which is also known as potassium hydroxide, to remove the carbon dioxide and make the air breathable again. Uh, A captain in the French Navy named Yves Le Prieur paid a visit to an industrial expo at Paris's Grand Palais in 1925. And this was a pivotal moment because he saw a diver in a demonstration there. And while this diver was showing off a torch that could cut iron underwater, that was not what fascinated uh, Prieur. He was, in fact, drawn to the man's breathing apparatus. And this was simply a rubber tube that was held in the diver's mouth, and it ran up to the surface and connected to a pump outside the water. And he also wore goggles on his eyes and a rubber clip on his nose. That particular piece of diving technology was invented in the 19-teens by a man named Maurice Fernez. And it's unusual because it let the diver wear a simple bathing suit and experience some freedom of movement. All of the other diving setups that uh, Yves Le Prieur had seen up to that point in his Navy career had been these really heavy helmets and these lead-soled boots that would really hinder your ability to move around. You would have minimal functions under the water. But even with the Expo Tank Diver's incredible ability to move however he wished, he was still tethered by that hose to his air supply. And so Prieur was inspired to combine that freedom that he noticed uh, from the heavy helmet and boots with a way to carry air independent, completely independent of a supply line. But first, he very politely contacted Maurice Fernet. The inventor of the system that he had, that he had seen at the Grand Palais demonstration, and he asked for permission to use that system as a starting point for his own idea. And so once he got that permission, he devised a system that had a mouthpiece that attached to a bottle of compressed air, which was a Michelin invention designed to inflate car tires. Yeah, I love this story because I love that one, he got permission from another inventor to kind of take off on his ideas. And two, that he was so uh, resourceful and ingenious that he adapted a, a a tire inflation system to use as like the air supply for divers. And uh, Yves Le Prieur further refined the design until he was confident enough to debut it publicly. And he again credited his predecessor. It was known as the Fernet Le Prieur device. It still had the mouthpiece and the compressed air, but he had also added these leather straps that kept the air canister on the diver's back. Eventually, Le Prieur moved the canister around the chest so that it wouldn't bang into things without people knowing about it, as anyone who has ever walked behind anyone at a convention wearing fairy wings can attest to be important. In 1933, Le Prieur presented this new version of his apparatus under his name exclusively, rather than the hyphenated name that his previous work had had before. And next up, a very, very famous name enters the picture and one that is quite dear to me personally. Uh, but before we get there, we're going to pause for a word from one of our sponsors. Yves Le Prieur continued to refine his underwater breathing devices. And then in June of 1939, he had a visit from a naval lieutenant named Jacques Cousteau. And the two men shared not only a naval background, but also just a love of diving, and they really hit it off. Several years later, in 1942, Cousteau once again visited Le Prieur, this time with his wife, Simone, and fellow diver Frédéric Dubac. Cousteau had been working on a diving device of his own and showed it to Le Prieur. The elder diver offered, offered him some feedback, suggesting that Cousteau alter the face mask design specifically. Cousteau's version at the time only had a breathing hose to the mouth, but Le Prieur thought the design would be safer if the mask covered the wearer's entire face. Yeah, Prieur, we had talked about him having a, a tube to the mouth, but it really did have like a uh, this funky little apparatus around your face. So it was really, really secure. And he felt like Cousteau's might be a little unsafe because it wasn't quite as anchored around the whole head. Uh, and Jacques Cousteau partnered shortly thereafter with Emile Gagnon, who was a senior engineer at a company called Air Liquide that manufactured industrial gases. And Cousteau's father-in-law, who also worked for Air Liquide, arranged this introduction of Cousteau and Gagnon. And when Cousteau and this man met, the engineer had actually been working on a valve system already that would enable cars to use natural gas instead of petrol. So once again, there's some borrowing from the automotive industry. 
Jack needed a similar valve for his diving design, but one that would carry compressed air to the diver's lungs through a breathing tube. And Gagnon designed a valve that allowed the diver to control the flow of air by only delivering a stream of it when the mouthpiece that contained the valve was sucked on. This design reduced the pressure of the air so that the intake would be suitable for a human. And then a rubber membrane released the air when the diver sucked in. And after months of testing, Cousteau and Gagnon named their device the Aqualung and began to market it. And Le Prieur's system, which had a continuous airflow system, was quickly dropped in favor of the Cousteau-Gagnon setup and its demand valve. The Aqualung was offered commercially in France in 1946, and then in Great Britain in 1950, in Canada in 1951, and in the United States in 1952. It became the first commercially successful scuba device. Le Prieur harbored some concerns about the demand valve that Cousteau and his partner had worked on. He was really concerned that if a diver lost consciousness underwater, he would drown because, again, the diver had to suck on that little valve to get the airflow, whereas Le Prieur's full face mask had this continuous flow. So it meant that even if a diver passed out, the mask wouldn't fall out and they would still be getting an oxygen supply. Just the same, Le Prieur in- adapted his own system to offer diver-regulated airflow. It was too late. Cousteau's system became the standard, and the two former Navy men who had once gotten along so beautifully wound up losing touch because Cousteau became famous both for his dive equipment and for his underwater films. Uh, And we should also point out that depending on which dive historian you ask or just dive uh, aficionado, the person actually credited as the first scuba diver differs. Uh, The word, which actually stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, was not actually coined until the 1950s. uh, And that was when Christian James Lamberston came up with a new name for the rebreather system that he had been working on for the U.S. Navy during World War II. Just the same. The name uh, has been retroactively applied to numerous systems, and it is often associated with and sometimes accidentally credited to Cousteau. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.